Subscribe to Danny Houston Podcast, man. Man, it's going down. It's Donnie Houston Podcast. I am Donnie Houston. Check it out, man. Uh, we got a real special guest today, man. Uh, the man is a legend, man, by, by many definitions. You know what I'm saying? He's a stand-up comedian. He's a college professor. He's an author, you know. Uh, he's a father, man, and, and, and so much more. Uh, and got him in here today, man. It's, it's an honor to have him, man. Marcus D. Wiley. What's going down? What up, Donnie Houston? What's the deal, man? <laughs> What's happening? You all right? I'm chilling, man. I'm chilling. Yeah. Thanks up? for having me, first of all. Man, I appreciate you coming through, man. Oh, no doubt. For sure. So so what's new? You just telling me, you know, we got the grown, grown, great, forgiving going down? Man, working on a tour, you know, over the pandemic. I've been on the shelf for two years. Um, and so I'm just trying to recoup some of this money I done lost. <laughs> and so I put a tour together, grown, great, forgiving, and uh, I'm trying to do 50 cities. Right now I'm booked at about 34, 35. Mm. It's from September the 1st to December 31st. Yeah, that's what's up. That's what's yeah. up. So, man, uh, talk a little bit because you you're a stand up comedian. We had Ali up here, you know what I'm saying? But I, that's my boy, you know, you, you're much more on the cleaner side of things. You yes. know what I'm saying? Like, yes. talk about your decision to even take that route with it. So, when I first started, I started doing comedy September the twentieth, uh, two thousand two. Hmm. That when I started, that was my first time being on stage, getting paid, and um, and I, I started at a coffee shop in Pearland, Texas. This is before Pearland was even built up like this. It was called Muddy Waters. And um, the lady, she wanted it clean and no vulgar. So I was doing it that way. And of course, that gravitated or that pulled churches. So it'd be like the singles ministry. They would sell out the whole coffee shop or the marriage ministry would sell it out. And so that's how I kind of got pulled into the church game. And when I got over there, it ain't that I went that route. It was like they pulled me in and they pay well. Hmm. And I just was cool with it. You and know? it's a lane if you if you own, you know if you funny and you doing your thing, you, you own that lane for sure. And so I, you know it, it, it happened to get me on you know your London Adams Morning Show, nationally syndicated show we did for fifteen years, and and it's just been good. You know you know you may you may won't be as popular or big and all that, but you will be um, compensated and you know live a good life. You know what I'm saying? And I'm grown, so that's what I <laughs> I just want to make sure you know the family's straight and I'm straight. You, we, we was talking about grown a little bit. Define grown, because that don't just mean, you know, I'm 21 or I'm 30. I'm, yeah, I'm nah, 40. I'm, nah, you know, it's, it's nah. more, you know. Don, a lot of people think because they growing that they grown. I got to tell my son that, brother, you're growing, but you're not grown. You know, I used to think, because this is my dad to say, my dad to say you grown when you are out on your own, alone, and don't need a loan. Hmm. That's what my dad would say. Because I was in college, got my own apartment. I still to call him, hey man, can you can I borrow five hundred dollars? He'll tell you, you ain't grown. Hmm. And so, but now as I've gotten older, to me, grown is when you're just not affected or influenced by pop culture, by what's going on. You know, I'm comfortable being me. I'm, you know, I do me. And my uncle Terry, you know, I'm talking about him in my act. He is the epitome of grown. Hmm. We talking about a cat who still got a Jerry curl. <laughs> He, oh, he, oh, he doing his own thing. He, Watch this yeah. here. Steel nugget rings. <laughs> you remember when they used to spray paint the bed of trucks back mm -hmm. in the day? He still got that. And ain't bothered by, still wear the same obsession, same cologne. <laughs> ain't, ain't thinking about no Issey Miyake, ain't no tongue for him on that new stuff. He still got the same, he's still him. And, you know, I used to joke at it, but now as I done got grown, I feel him. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I mean... I ain't tripping. You know, you can chase all the new fads and new stuff, but what worked for me, worked for me. Hmm. 
Yeah, I feel that. Yeah, man, talk about uh, cause I mean I know you from the H, man. What side did you uh, did you grow up on? So I was born in Ray. I was born in Fourth Ward. Fourth Ward. I don't know if you're familiar with the wards. Mm -hmm. Fourth Ward is the first ward that was built. I don't know how I got fourth when it was first. See, I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, the first. It was called Freedman's Town, mm -hmm. and so that's why I was born. Uh, and then uh, after fifth grade, my mom got married, and we moved to Missouri City. That's when I moved to most cities. So I spent. Uh, middle school and high school in Mo City. Uh, I had a two-year scholarship at this uh, community college. Well, well, before that, though, we, we, we okay. gotta stay in Mo City because you Let's stay in Mo City. You going to the Ridge? So where else? Where else am I going? Nah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm that. going to see, the see, Ridge. See, see if, if my memory serves me correct, you over there with guys like Come on, face. Come on. I oh, could have been yeah. a ghetto boy. I ain't want to. I ain't want to say that. Well, I know you're so well, used to. So you beat me to it. I wasn't gonna bring it up because I heard, okay. I heard <laughs> from what I hear, you, you run from this part of your life, but you, but you used to rap. You know what I'm saying? Over there with my boy Def Jam Blaster. Yes, man. sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Def yeah. Jam Blaster, Will Ross. That was my DJ. Uh, you know Brad Scarface. He would come through. We would all be at at our uh, Blaster's crib, and uh, you could tell though back then, Brad was serious. You know, he was older, a little bit older than me, but he was serious about it. I was just good at it. You know, it's, it's a difference when somebody take the craft and they really, that's their thing. Uh, I was just creative enough to, you know, make words rhyme. And so... Uh, Even my, my, my cousin, uh, Mr. 3-2's over there with y'all. Come on, 3-2, come on. We was trainers together at Willow Ridge. Oh, shit. Yeah, uh, Chris, come on. All that. I'm connected, man. But somebody <laughs> stole my rap book. <laughs> they stole my book. That's when I stopped rapping, man. They somebody <laughs> they knew I was fly with it. I had them all in the spiral, man. They stole my book, uh, ninth grade, and I, that's when I stopped. But yeah, but definitely grew up, grew up. Hunters, we lived in every Hunters Glen except Hunters Glen Five. Uh, you know, we moved around from Hunters Glen Four to Hunters Glen Three to Hunters Glen One and Two. Hunters Point. Hmm. Yeah, lived in all of them, but some some reason my dad he did not want us moving out of Mo City, so went to Missouri City Middle School, went to Willow Ridge High School. Damn. Okay, so you talking about the scholarship? What were you doing to get the scholarship? What kind of scholarship? So I had a dual scholarship. I played basketball, but I was an athletic trainer. All my partners played football. Football was my is is my favorite sport. Loved it, but that's a man sport. That's a man sport, and I wasn't growing at the rate. That them boys was growing at that time, you know, and so I knew my football days, they ended in the seventh grade, but I still wanted to be with my partners. And so, man, when I found out you could be a trainer, get a letterman's jacket, you know, because that was big in my day, getting your jacket. So I got that beginning of my sophomore year and uh, I got scholarships as athletic trainer. I got scholarships to UT, a and Southwest Texas, which is called Texas State now. Uh, North Texas, Stephen F. Austin, to be an athletic trainer. No, I never even knew that was even a thing, like you could get a scholarship. Yeah, yeah, I did that. And then I also had basketball scholarships to a couple of JUCOs, you know, nothing major. I was a little bitty cat. Um, and so I ended up going to Angelina Community College in Lufkin, Texas. It's about uh, two hours out of Houston, in Lufkin. And I did that for two years. And then... Uh, you know, I wanted to go black, so uh, I was going to go to Southern. Actually, I was going to Southern because I had a girl in Southern, mm. and I wanted to go keep an eye on my lady. Uh, but my parents said if I come to TSU, they'll help me get a car. And I knew with a car I can get another lady. You know, because <laughs> <laughs> you got you, to be able to move around. You got to be able to move around. When you got a car, you get another girl. And so I came to TSU, man. It was one of the best decisions ever. And so I. Got my bachelor's and my master's from TSU. What'd you, what'd you, I graduated from TSU. What'd yeah. you major in? Why you I majored in, in uh, it was called telecommunications back in the day, but it's radio, TV, film today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I got my on my master's just communications. So you went straight uh, bachelor's, master's, you went straight through? Yeah, kind of, I think, but that first year, because I, I, I didn't want no master's. I felt like I had already overachieved, you know what I'm saying? I was, at that time, maybe the second person in my family to have a degree. And so I was like, I'm good, you know. But when I graduated, I went from the graduation line to the unemployment line. <laughs> and so I went back to college, you know what I'm saying, and then just got a master's because I didn't have a job, you know, but it worked out. So yeah. so after you get the master's, because, I mean, how do you end up going? Because I know you went to BET. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? How do you end up making that connection? So, like I always tell people, 
<laughs> some people rich monetary, but you can be rich in relationships, you know, and that's, and that's, to me, that's even more important, you know? And so when I was at TSU, I had a circle of friends, Dr. Teeth, I don't know if you're familiar, he did the videos for everybody. Guy named Keelan Farouk, he with Exotic Pop now. Um, I had John Jones, Cliff McBean, um, who got his own production company, Blue Fire, uh, Chris Holt, Chris Mayberry. So all these guys, we had this thing, we was doing these shows at TSU. But we said when one make it, pull the other cat up. So Dr. Teeth, John Tucker, he makes it at BET. He sent something we did at TSU together, submitted to BET, they hired him as an editor. He worked his way up to the producer of Rap City. Hmm. When he got that, he just started pulling us in. So at one, once upon a time, out of the seven guys that hung together at TSU, six of us working at BET, whether it was on Rap City, Cedar's World, Hits from the Streets, we were just, we were just all around there. And so that's how I got to BET. John Tucker told me what questions they was going to ask in the interview. Man, he had me so prepared. I'm in there. It was like taking candy from a baby. And so, you know, did that for three years. So what were you doing over there? I mean, I know you said it was Hits from the Streets, but like, mm -hmm. what was your role over there? I was producer. Mm -hmm. So the producer at BET for Hits from the Streets, you uh, write the show. You come up with the show concept, write the idea out, direct it. And then you edit it as well. You When you get back from out of town, you go in the studio, book your edit times, and you edit it all together. So it really taught you how to be well-rounded, you know, be able to do everything. And so, uh, and I credit that to TSU too, though. You know, whether they did it indirectly or directly, you know, it just taught me how to deal, how to be versatile, you know, and do everything. So after yeah. you leave there, like, how did, when did the stand-up, because you still ain't talking about doing no stand-up. Yeah, comedy. I'm not stand-up at all. Sidebar, before this, because I remember we, we, you know, we had sat in at, with Ali at the 85 South, yeah. and he had mentioned about a movie you did. I when, did the movie. With these same guys, we did a movie. We did maybe three, four movies in college. Uh, the movie he was talking about was called 21 Crunk Street. We would make plays off of movies that was already out. So it was a show, 21 Jump Street, back in the day. We did 21 Crunk Street. This one bars in Houston was throwing, you know, how we was doing. <laughs> the roof, yeah, yeah, yeah. the roof, 21 Crunk Street. We did that. Uh, we did a She's, uh, uh, we did a He's Gotta Have It. Talking about these girls at the time. This is when you was calling girls boppers and all that. And we act like the dude, we try to get with the chick, didn't work out, he hit the lottery, now here she come back, you know all that. Uh, we did another one, oh man, we did maybe four, maybe four, maybe four movies. And this is how I was getting paid in college. So what y'all putting them, how do you, how do you get the funds, I mean, not the funds to make it, but like how do you making money out there? So you having showings for We're them doing showings, thing? right. So you know, we filming it guerrilla style. Of course we renting, uh, getting the equipment from the uh, communications department. And uh, man, oh boy, you taking me back. These are some good times. And so, uh, what we would do, we put the film together, and then we do the flyers. Hey, premiering this movie. Of course, we had people at the school in the movie, so that kind of you know. And then we would hit people. We was getting interviewed on on the news for ABC and NBC and CBS and just locally. And we do a red carpet. We had a limousine service pick up the students and drop them off. Mm. Man, we had the whole thing and we would charge maybe $8, $10, something like that. And so any given time we would show some, we probably make about 10 grand. Not, ain't a lot of money, but in college, yeah, you're doing all right. You doing all right. I mean, so you got, of course we got to break it down between the seven of us. So we might end up everybody getting about $1,100 or we might get 800, donate 15 to the department. That way I ain't got to go to class like everybody else, you know, because they like, he, he grown, mm -hmm. you know, he, 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 you know, he giving back already. And so that's what we did. So, yeah. One thing about comedy, though, at this time. So then how do you even get pulled into to doing that? So this is what happened. Crazy. With the comedy, I always been witty. I always been able to, um, you know, hold an audience attention just from hosting shows and stuff like that. Uh, but. When I get back to Houston, because I had told my wife, I got married like at, at 24. And so I had told my wife, I was like, look, man, I need you to give me five years to chase my dreams. Uh, and I don't want to hear your mouth. You know, just <laughs> give me five. I know it sounds bad, but I don't want to hear you. Man, you, you need to work. Man, get, I had dreams before I had you. You know, that's what I told her. I said, so, um, you know, let me chase it. 
And so that was during the time of BET. I was chasing for those three years. Then um, when I got back home, you know, I was just going to be a good little citizen and find me a good job and just whatever. But a guy at my church, he said, hey, man, you might want to um, try comedy. And I was like, I ain't no comedian. You know, he was like, well, bro, you funny. You, you might want to try it. So what confirmed that was I hosted a show at my church, and that's when the lady from Muddy Waters was there. And she called the church and wanted to talk to the comedian. And they was like, what comedian? So you was just there as a host, but you, but you got little bits and people told I got a little because I'm joking. Yeah, but I ain't, I ain't no com comedian. So even the people at the church, when she called, they was like, ain't no comedian work here. They was like, no, he hosted the Christmas gala. They was like, oh, you talking about Marcus? Oh, he ain't no comedian. And so she said, "Can I? do you have some numbers on him? Can I get in touch with him? And so she hit me up, and when she called me, man, she was like, bro, I want you to do my coffee shop. We knew out here, and we celebrating one year. We would love for you to come do your comedy. I was like, I ain't no comedian. She was like, yeah, but you funny. And I was like, yeah, but I ain't no comedian. It's just my church folk. You know, people at the church, they know me. And so she said, well, I have $500. And I mean, at, that, at that time... I was probably making twelve hundred dollars a month. She finna pay me five hundred dollars on this particular Friday. So you know, I tried it. After I did it, three days later, she calls me back. The people out here love you. They want to do this once a month, and I'm gonna pay you seven fifty. Hmm. So now I'm making twelve fifty a month. She finna pay me seven fifty every third Friday was the date. I said what? So man, I just you know, I took it serious, and you know that's when I kind of took off. I thought God, this was a, you know, He was opening the door. What you gonna do? You gonna be scared, or you gonna walk through it? You know what I'm saying? And so I walked through it, and I ain't looked back since. Hmm. So how do you even take that? Because just going from just doing you know coffee shops and things like that to yeah. really taking it up to that next level, and you know getting the attention to move around, or did you take it amongst yourself to just say I'm gonna just start hitting cities and and you know. Yeah, so, you know, I'm a church boy. My pop, my dad's a pastor, grandfather, great-grandfather. So it's a little scripture that say your gift will make room. And so I just kept trying to work on my gift. And, man, and it just started opening doors, you know. I went from the coffee shop. I did a, you know, a pastor came in and said, man, can you do this at my church? Because the coffee shop too small. It only seated maybe 100 people. He said, can you do this at my church? I'm like, yeah, I went and did at his church. About 1,200 people was there. But he got all his pastor friends there. So they said, hey, bro, I like this. Can you do this at my church? And that's how I just started snowballing, snowballing, snowballing. And so, you know, I became a working comedian probably a year into it where I'm just working where people calling, you know, to book me, you know, and, and people probably don't even know except the places that I'm going. But, yeah. So I, I've been working. Was there ever a time, did you ever pull an Al Green when you was like, you know, I'm doing this church thing, but I might do a little backsliding over here, you know? Now, <laughs> well, but, but, or did you just commit to like, well, this is what it is? I'm no, so what I do, I don't call myself like a Christian comedian. It's, that sounds so corny and stupid to me, you know, because it's a lot of Christians and they don't put the title on their occupation. You know what I'm saying? Just because. What know, you believe in that don't define. Yeah, that don't define. Mean. Right. So I'm a, I'm a comedian that happens to be a Christian, but I ain't no Christian comedian. And so. Um, um, so I didn't have a problem working the clubs, which I still work. You know, you mentioned Ali. Ali is really, he done took me with him for the, over the pandemic because the church has been closed, but the club's been open. So I've been traveling him for the better part of two years, you know, and uh, featuring for him. And, uh, you know, I go in the club saying, well, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to go in there and do me. You know, people, they tend to, you know, enjoy it. And so, um, yeah, I do the theaters. I mean, whatever. Concerts. Man, I just want the money. I'm, I'm about the money. And, you know, I ain't gonna, don't get me wrong, I ain't just going to do anything for the money. But if it's a show, I don't care if it's hip-hop, rap, neo-soul. Man, when I first started, we had to perform at a strip club. <laughs> Wait, what? Are you there with other, like... Cleaner comedians? Or no. Like, you just, this is on the comedy this, circuit. This, yeah. this, 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 because when, you know, if you funny, you funny. You know what I'm saying? It ain't no, oh, he can't or she can't mm -hmm. do that. 
you got to come in here and adapt to, you know, what you're seeing. And so, you know, man, we had a strip club. It was called Ass Night. <laughs> where, where, now, where, I only did it one time. Where, where, is, where, where Ass Night was at? Ass Night was, oh, what name of that strip club? Ali know because he booked it. I can't think of the name of the club, but yeah, man, you got, you, you know, you there. And, and they tell you, hey, man, just give me 15 minutes, $400. You know, it was back in the day. Come on, I ain't finna pass up $400. I can, I'm pretty sure I can I can hold their attention for 15 minutes to get this 400 You know what I'm saying? And so, man, we was doing happy hours where guys in there talking to women. They ain't listening to us on stage. But you know what it what it did? It just, it gets you ready for whatever. You know, I've, I've done a funeral. <laughs> a funeral. People got in touch with me. Hey, my mama listened to you every day on the radio while she was going through chemo. She lived another two years laughing at you every day, and we would love for you to come perform at my mama's funeral. Like at the funeral? How did you prepare for something? Do you have to get information on the dead at that point? Like, so what I did, because I didn't know, you right, <laughs> I didn't know the lady, but what I did, I went read the obituary, because I, I was nervous. I was like, man, I don't, what do I do, you know? But I went read the obituary when I got there, and I pulled three things out this obituary that I wanted to talk about, joke about. And, I, and it took off, man. Them folk in there just dying laughing. Everybody not happy but the pastor. Because he like, this is this is the yeah. devil. He going to hell. He man. going to hell in there laughing. But you know, that's what the family wanted. And they paid my money. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, it's whatever. So when, at this time, because you talk my little sister at Persian, man. Uh, yeah. Who's your sister? Jocelyn Joseph. She used to hoop. Okay. Um, okay. But she's like. I got fired. No shit. Oh, I got five from Persia. Yeah, I got five. I should have got five too. I mean, so this ain't like they did me wrong, but they did do me wrong. Yeah. Middle school, that's probably the worst age to teach. So you got, because they want to be grown one day, they want to be kids yeah, yeah, one day. Yeah, that line, yeah. And so at that time, Don, I'm probably 22, 23, somewhere up in here. And these kids, you know, for the most part, they cool, but you're going to have the ones that's going to try you. So I get with them, you know, tell them, yeah, it's whatever. The handbook say just touch me. Yeah, all you got to do is just graze me. I'm going to knock you out. You know, I'm, I'm on their level, you know, because you can't cower down them kids. And so, man, the, the administration, they didn't like that. They didn't like how I would handle, how I would handle stuff. I was just doing what was done to me or what I saw growing up. Man, they they. they so where you had to roughen up a kid or what, 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 what? I didn't rough them up, but boy, I talk real greasy to them. Oh, I tell them, oh yeah, your mama don't like you. Yeah, the principal don't like you. I don't like you. Nobody likes you. I want to let they, you. Then that's when they fold back. Yeah, now, now you want to be a kid again, but you you was all big a few minutes ago. Yeah, I tell them, yeah, yeah, mama hates you, dog. Yeah, why you think she just buy you some expensive shoes, but she don't support nothing you do. Yeah, don't nobody like you here. You're ruining these kids' little oh, self-esteem. Man, oh, man, listen. <laughs> I would go in, and then so they would be like, write them up. I ain't got to write them up because I'm good with this mouthpiece. And then if I found out you played sports, I go to tell the coach, hey, man, giving me a problem in class. Can I discipline him? Because I played sports. So I get the whistle and go out there, have them rolling and doing all that type of stuff. Then they go home and tell their mama. Mama come up there. Why is Mr. Wiley the fine arts teacher? Outside discipline, and then that's all oh, you know. I just I was in the office more than the kids. So wait, wait. So how long did you last as a middle school teacher? Oh, probably about four months. Oh, this was a quick thing. Oh, it's very quick. They reassigned me to a warehouse, right? <laughs> how I finally got fired. The last the the, the 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 straw that broke the camel's back was it was a little cat in there named Oscar. He was hell on wheels, and he knew it too. But I told him, I said, Oscar. I don't like you. You know, your mama don't like you. Uh, nobody likes you. That's why they let you do what you do. They waiting on you to get shot or go to jail. Like this, I'm told, yeah, I'm, I, it ain't going to sound right right now, especially in today's climate. But you had to know Oscar for, for you to understand how I'm talking. And so I say that. I say, so, man, you beat me. I told him, you have won. You don't have to come back to this class no more. And I'm going to give you a beat. He said, what? I said, don't show up here ever again, and I'm going to put a B on your report card. He said, bet. 
Man, it was probably about three weeks went by. Hadn't seen him. We was fine. The day I brought him up, hey, class, what? Oh, have, do y'all know where Oscar be? And he's like, oh, yeah, he just been in the library doing this class period. Next thing I know, knock on the door. It's the principal. He, I come out there, he with Oscar. <laughs> it was my fault because I didn't tell Oscar. Hold it down. If you get caught, I didn't tell him what to say. So that's on me. Oscar, he come out there, that man said, did you tell Oscar? Principal, did you tell Oscar he ain't got to come back to class? And you was going to give him a B? I said, is that what, is that what I said? <laughs> Oscar said, yeah. I said, well, I must have said it. And that principal said, oh, man, Mr. Wiley. So, boom, he left. They called me in the office. They reassigned me to a warehouse. I was at this warehouse one day. I'm sitting there with a black lady. I said, ma'am, she ain't talking, I ain't talking. I said, ma'am, uh, do I have some work to do? She was like, and I noticed she wasn't just saying nothing. I said, wait a minute, ma'am, am I fired? She was like, I said, yeah, I'm fired. But I'm under contract, so they got to pay me for the rest of the year. Bet. I said, ma'am, here go my page. And this one pages was stealing. Here go my page number. If anybody looking for me, page me. And I never went back to that warehouse. I was there that, that one day only. And I had to get paid all the way up to May. But watch this. Can never work in HISD again. Oh, you got banned? I'm in the red file. That's why I love when they call me to do shows. I tell, I always... You know, they said I wasn't going to make no, I couldn't work at HISD, but y'all still call me to do teachers and service days and all this. Still getting bread off you. <laughs> this is some wild ass shit, man. Still getting bread. But yeah, I can't work at HISD no more. So, they railroaded me. <laughs> so, okay, but HISD was, at what, what, at what point is this? Because you, you did BET, and, like where are you this at? This right before I went to BET. Okay, okay. So this right after I graduated from high, um, from high school. I graduated from TSU. That was my first job, a teacher, you know. That's what most people do, you know. I was a teacher, and then I, that's when I got the call from John Tucker by going to BET. So, I, boom, I get, and then I go to BET. Hmm. I mean, it worked out. Yeah. It worked out. It's all good. I ain't mad at HSD. So, how do you, how do you end up uh, connecting with, like, Yolanda Adams to do the radio show? And uh, connecting with Yolanda, what is it called? Houston... Texas, Black Chambers, Commerce, something. They had a show. They was honoring Yolanda Adams at this show. I'm the host of the show. Doing my thing, Don, I promise you. Nobody, it seemed like nobody laughing but Yolanda and her table. Everybody else in there, you know, when people get dressed up sometimes, they're a little, they're a little stiff. But Yolanda now laughing loud, and she got one of them good laughs that keep you going. So after the show, she was like, brother, you was hilarious. I said, thank you. That's all. Next thing I know, about a month later, Yolanda was morning show in Houston. They had another comedian that was supposed to be on there, but he couldn't get the contract together. I like to say God blocked it. Uh, so they needed a comedian. And they was giving her all these names. And she said, nah, it's a dude I saw at this event. And so at that time, Larry was her co-host. And she was coming up and Larry said, you talking about Marcus Wilde? I got his number right here. Larry called me and said, hey, man, her and Yolanda, him and Yolanda. And they said, man, you want to audition for this show? I said, yeah. I almost said, hell yeah, but I knew Yolanda was on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, What year is this? This is 2006. Mm -hmm. It's 2006. And they said, you want to uh, audition for this show? I said, yeah. I said, I'll be there Friday. I went up there Friday, audition. They invite me back the next Friday. Then the third Friday, Yolanda said, you got the job. And man, that's when everything just, because it was uh, just in Houston at that time. And two weeks later, we were syndicated. Mm. And we went from nine markets to 58 markets. So that's how I got across the country a little bit. You know, that boosted, you know, my little, you know, my little sting up, so. Okay, tell me this with the Yolanda thing, because this is, my mom would call me and tell me I had to check out this <laughs> Bishop Secular. 
And it became a thing the way I started checking yeah. for him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, man, bitch Shek to be tripping, man. Can you give me a bit with that? Because I'm going to just play this on mom. Like, mom, I had bitch and Shek down here for you. Know Good morning, Yolanda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is Bishop Secular. Yeah. So, Bishop Secular, man, it's crazy. It took off. It was something I was already doing before the radio. So, if I hosted a concert, I would come out as me. And then I bring up an act. And then I come back out in my role, Bishop Secular, where I go through the audience. It was just some crowd participation type stuff. When I got on the show, Larry, who had saw it before, he said, man, you need to bring that Bishop character on the show. I was like, you sure? He was like, yeah. And man, it took off. It took off so much to where when I would go perform, people would come to me and say, where's Bishop Secular? And I'd be like, they didn't even know it was me. And that's when I had to start letting people know, no, 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 I'm Bishop Seckler. Because when Bishop Seckler died or this show in, y'all need to know me, Marcus D. Wiley. And so, because at first I wouldn't let nobody know, you know. But uh, but once I realized he was here and Marcus was here, I said, oh, yeah, I need to let folk know, you know, that's me. Hmm. Yeah. Man, so when, so when do you actually go to TSU and get into the whole... Because I'm trying to get all the graduated. I don't know. I ain't got no masters, but I kind of want to go to TSU and figure out how I can do so with the communication department. How did you make that? Uh... So, again, rich in relationships. My dean, um, he was, um, I knew him in undergrad, but he was my teacher in grad school. And he was tough on me. I'm talking about, I get up to do a presentation. He'd be like, man, sit you down. Was it Dean Ward? Dr. Ward, James Wesley okay. Ward. He would, he would, destroy me you ain't prepared you ain't da, da, da. i'm talking about, i'll be like bro you he wasn't prepared but you're bothering me but you know i don't you know i just go sit down i thought i was failing this class i go ask him hey man do i need to drop this class he was like did i tell you to drop it i'd be like no nah, but it don't seem like i'm made he say man just keep fighting you know so i would do it so once i left bet and came back home I needed a job. I wasn't doing comedy yet. And I was, start, I was working on staff at the church. And then I went over to him. I said, hey, doc, you know, I would like to teach. I feel like I got a little experience, you know, working at BT for three years that I can, you know, kind of let people know. And so he said, all right, he tried me out with two classes. Let's call that adjunct. You know, we don't give you two classes. A Thursday night and a Saturday morning. Hmm. The worst schedule ever. Yeah, yeah. But the Saturday morning, it was an old lady in my class. Finna show you, it's crazy. Old lady go, tell Dr. Ward, hey, the best teacher up here is that young man on Saturdays. He on time. He structured. He got something to say. She just propped me up. I don't know nothing about this. And it made him give me full time. No shit. <laughs> that's how it happened, man. That's, that's just how it happened. This, this old lady went to him and said, the best teacher up here. Because she, because you know, a lot of times the teacher, they get comfortable. They show up late. They, you know, and how, you know, I'm hungry. So I, everything, you ain't finna, I ain't finna give no reason not to, you know what I'm saying? You know, not to go with me. So, and that's what he told me. He said, man, this lady came in and talked real, real good about you. Hmm. So how do how do you balance all these things? Being a stand up, doing the the you know school thing, doing you know the yeah. radio show, all that. Like it all just kind of went together. It all kind of go together. You know, when I was on the radio early in the morning, that was from five to nine. Then I would leave, go TSU, and those classes for me would start at ten, eleven, whatever. Do two classes a day, and then most times I'm traveling on the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, come back Sunday evening, and so it just. It was a great schedule. I mean, you know, it just it just worked together. And it's like you just get paid to talk, hmm. you know, which is beautiful. Hmm. Yeah. That's what's up, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, we got we got grown, uh, great and forgiving, man. What else, what else we got coming up in the future, man? Oh, man, right now, this is it. This is all I'm focused on. I'm trying to get, oh, I can't put the money figure out there, but I'm trying to get in the black, you know, because I've been in the red. I tell everybody I had... I had money saved for a rainy day when the pandemic hit. But I didn't have money saved for a rainy year. And so I'm just trying to get trying to get some of it back. And so once that's finished, 
then I probably start back doing my only shows. You know, I do these shows like pastors only, first ladies only, praise team only. Well, you know, I just structure my material just for these people, mm. you know, and so th those shows go real well, you know, so I probably now try to take them abroad. I do them here in Houston, but I ain't really just took, ain't took them all over, you know, where I perform at. So, yeah, that might be what I look at in 2023. And, and we done with the rapping. You just you ain't never. Y'all. No, I'm not going back to the rap. I mean, especially I don't think they, I don't think they making the same type of money that they was making back in the day. You know, yeah. you know. But I started small time, yeah. dope gang, coke. Okay. Gang. <laughs> <laughs> for, sure. for sure, that's what it is, man. Well, man, I appreciate you coming through, man. Man, thanks for having me. I had a good time. Appreciate it. I read it. I read it. man. It's Danny Sh Podcast. Marcus D. Wiley. Hey, man, we up out of here. Cheese. Cheese. Oh, yeah. Danny Houston. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh